I, be, I know Murad's making fun of me. He said, dude, you've been trying to watch this for like the beginning from the beginning of the stream. And he's right. This video is made possible by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Watch another brand new full length companion video to this one in my ongoing modern you conflict did, series this? that explains the entire like course it? of the 2008 Russian invasion of Georgia, as well as the entire war so far between Russia and Ukraine since 2014 in the Donbass, all of which you can access by signing up for the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle deal for less than $15 a year at curiositystream.com slash real life lore. But here, just order food. Throughout the past few months, there has been almost constant news and coverage in the West about Russia's imminent plans to invade Ukraine. Started large scale military drills this morning. And this is a very dangerous moment. Yes, very fears good. Of an invasion. More than 2,000 uh, troops, according to American intelligence, sent within the 24 hours. American citizens should leave, should leave now. On the morning of February the 24th, these fears proved to be well founded. Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, effectively declared war on Ukraine and authorized the Russian military to invade the country. Explosions were quickly reported afterwards across the country. And immediately prior to this declaration, the Russian army had amassed around 200,000 soldiers, along with their tanks, artillery, equipment, and field hospitals across their border, and many others inside of Belarus along their border with Ukraine. For comparison, this is nearly the same size as the entire Ukrainian military, and about the same number of troops sent by the United States when invading Iraq in 2003. This is certainly large enough to be an effective invasion force. Even further, the Russian government has recognized the independence of the two breakaway states inside of Ukraine, Donetsk and Luhansk, and ordered Russian troops inside of both. When factoring in the Russian military presence already stationed in Crimea, you can quickly begin seeing that the Russians have Ukraine almost entirely surrounded. And now that war has broken out, it has the potential to unleash the most serious conflict seen in Europe since the Second World War. And the biggest question on everybody's mind this entire time has been this. What exactly does Vladimir Putin and Russia want with Ukraine? Judas, honestly, I don't know what to say. Words can never convey the horrors of going on in Ukraine today, and I never expected these events to pass. I began making this video five weeks ago, and I genuinely was not expecting the invasion to take place a few days ago. Once it did, I struggled with whether or not I should still release this, and ultimately decided that it still offered valuable perspective and went ahead. My heart and full support uh, is with the Ukrainian people and the Russian people who did not want this war. Ukraine. And the answer is, of course, it's complicated. The origins of what Putin wants today are rooted in what happened more than three decades ago back in the early 1990s when the Soviet Union first collapsed. For centuries before this event, whether as part of the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire, the modern countries we know of today as Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and others had all been a part of the same country, and their people had largely moved between all of them across generations. These places are all deeply and intimately connected by their shared history, and for decades, that history involved being widely recognized as one of the world's most dominant and formidable global superpowers. But all of that changed in late 1991, when, suddenly, the sweeping United Empire Russia has officially recognized the first Russian military officer killed. Uh, the head of Dagestan, Sergei Melikov, expresses his condolences to the family of Officer Nurmagomed Godzi Magomedov, who was killed in Ukraine. I think this is their first, like, confirmed uh, military officer uh, death. Couches with the fact that it's next to, I mean, if it's, the, if they're saying that the Russian government it recognize it, then, you know, I just found out my dad is a Hassan Abi head and it's absolutely blowing my mind. That's very strange, but shouts out to your family. I hope your dad is subscribed because the top of the hour ad break is here because otherwise he's going to see a fucking ad right now at the top of the hour that had Not existed in some form or another for centuries. So no ads in Russia. Yeah, I don't think they serve ads in Russia. So at least that's there's that. Trees collapsed and left in its place 15 newly independent republics. Today, the largest of them, Russia, has only half of the population that the former United Soviet Union had. 
and she possesses an economy that's only moderately larger than Spain's, a country with only a third of the population that ceased being a great power back in the 18th century. At the same time, the massive amounts of territories that were once dominated from the central government in Moscow have been shrinking almost continuously ever since. During the Cold War, there were two- They're saying that that dude died in 2007, but maybe it's a fucking another dude with the same name, I don't know, I mean- Rival competing well, anyway, military let's alliances going. on the European continent. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, in the West, and the Warsaw Pact in the East. Moscow didn't outright rule the countries of the Warsaw Pact, but they were effectively locked into Moscow's orbit as thralls or puppet states. From Moscow's perspective, these states provided a massive buffer against any potential military incursion from their primary Cold War rivals to the West in NATO. You see, from the Netherlands in the West to the Ural Mountains in the East, this whole part of Europe Europe is dominated by a geographic feature called the North European Plain. Almost entirely flat, the plain is shaped like a funnel, with a very narrow width in northern Germany, but with a mouth that opens up increasingly wider as it approaches the Ural Mountains. As the open plain gets wider across the east, it becomes increasingly difficult to defend across its entire length, and as a result, from the perspective of any regime based in Moscow, regardless of the time period and regardless of the ideology, it is imperative to expand control westwards across as much of this open plain as possible in order to narrow the gap that they need to defend in the event of a conflict with the West. That is a perfect answer to the chatter's question earlier. The Shaklone, our Kurdish chatter in the chat, saying if they have all that land, why do they need more? That's because... They need to fucking uh, put more space, more protective, uh, more of a protective barrier between Moscow, the actual land that fucking matters where the country is being run from, and uh, and and uh, other world powers that want to uh, potentially invade one day if they if that were to ever happen. West during the Cold War, the control. Shaklon got banned from being from League for being toxic and racist. Wait, really? Holy shit, bro. How the fuck do you get banned from League for being toxic and racist? It's like, that's like next level, dude. Isn't that like, doesn't that increase? I thought when you play League, you get like boosted. You're ELO, you get ELO boosted if you're with racism. Like I literally thought like they, you, you rank up harder the more toxic you are. That's some next level shit. All right, this plane by a regime in Moscow was at its greatest historical extent and was exerted either outright or by proxy from the Urals all the way through East Germany. And the entire wider section of the funnel was firmly controlled by Moscow, with Austria and Finland remaining neutral and Yugoslavia a non-aligned communist state. The only fronts that Moscow at the time had to truly worry about against NATO were across the Sudeten Mountains, the Black Sea, and a narrow line across the North European plain in central Germany. All easily defensible positions. Any invasion of the Soviet world from the west across these geographic frontiers would have been incredibly difficult. But in the 30 years since 1991, the situation has changed dramatically against Moscow's favor. Today, the former Warsaw Pact territories of East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria are all a part of NATO, while the former Soviet republics themselves of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia all are as well. This reality... So, a lot of these countries were able to join NATO before Russia was able to... Uh, before Russia was able to basically uh, restore some of its power as a nation, it happened uh, shortly after the, the Soviet Union dissolved and was being actively sacked by Western powers. And therefore, a lot of those countries were able to get in. So remember that when you when you all oh, when you always say like well what about what about all these fucking countries that are in NATO that are like Baltic uh, countries like how the fuck did they? Uh, get to do this versus 
how the fuck did they get to do this versus like Ukraine and Georgia? NATO front lines significantly further to the east across the wider section of the North European plain and a separated Russian territory between the mainland and the Kaliningrad exclave here across what's known as the Suvalki Gap. If you're sitting in the Kremlin in Moscow and you still believe that NATO is a hostile military alliance or could become one in the future, then this situation understandably looks pretty grim. But it's not totally lost yet. In the years following the breakup of the Soviet Soviet Union, many of the newly independent republics established and joined their own military alliance called the Collective Security Treaty Organization or CSTO, which in Europe consists of Russia, Belarus, and Armenia. Dude, it's kind of wild how disorienting it is that this motherfucker flipped the map, by the way. Like, I've just been every time, every time we look at a different angle, I'm like, Ugh, where are we? Where is like, I have to orient, I have to reorient myself by looking at Turkey, you know? Like, where's Turkey? Where's Turkey? So I can understand uh, where the rest of the planet is. And the different colors that he's using to show, like, landmass, with uh, the landmass being blue makes it even fucking worse. Anyway. But not Ukraine which has remained a sort of neutral zone as the treaty blocks established and joined their own military alliance called the Collective Security Treaty Organization or CSTO, which in Europe consists of Russia, Belarus, and Armenia, but not Ukraine, which has remained a sort of neutral zone between NATO in the West and the CSTO in the East. And now, within this lens, you can easily see why Ukraine is currently and always will be a geographic core interest to Moscow. If Ukraine is within Moscow's orbit, then it pushes the CSTO's and Moscow's defensive lines to the Carpathian Mountains in the southwest, and it narrows their exposure across the North European plain to only the eastern border of Poland. And while the Baltic states do lie across the plain as well, CSTO forces could easily encircle them by rapidly advancing across the narrow Suvalki gap between Kaliningrad and Belarus, and cut them off from the rest of NATO, meaning that they aren't as grave of a a geographical threat. Conversely, however, if Ukraine became a NATO member state, it would surge the NATO front lines far beyond the Carpathian Mountains and far across the wider section of the North European plain and place the new defensible front line across nearly 2,300 kilometers of open, hard to defend flat land, the easternmost section of which would only be a little more than 300 kilometers away from Volgograd, which, if taken, would shut down the entire Volga River and cut off Russia's valuable oil and gas resources coming up from around the Caspian Sea from the rest of the country, as nearly happened during the Second World War back when the city was better known as Stalingrad. Even further, Belarus, a friendly and loyal CSTO state that is often considered a mere extension of Moscow itself. Like I've said, Belarus is the Canada of, of Russia. Like the little brother that just like stands behind uh, Russia and goes like, "Oh, I'll I'll punch him too for you." It's cool. Like, do you want me to? Do you want me to throw? Do you want me to throw a punch? It's fine. Like, would suddenly become an indefensible salient protruding deep into the NATO front line. Yes, I said, Canada is America's vassal state. That's right. Canada is America's hat. Sorry, Canadians. Fucking deal with it, dude. You had like American LARPers. You had like. A hundred LARPing Canadians who think they're Americans totally effectively shut down your capital for like a month because they were, because they had trucks and they were going, we love America, QAnon, beep, beep. Why can't, you know, Donald Trump be our president too? Just like he's the president of America. That's some straight up America's hat behavior right there. Also, the other reason why I say that is because like Canada is always uh allowed to uh basically hide as like a a more civilized more european uh version of america but does like the exact same shit that america does whether it be arms sales training fucking radicals in other countries you know numerous other atrocities that they contribute to only to hide behind america to be like well we're not as bad as they are eh so you know anyway let's continue Rounded entirely by nato territory on three flanks Thus, Ukraine's outright control by Moscow, or at least neutrality, is essential to the defense of the CSTO and Russia, if you believe that NATO is a hostile aggressor or could become one in the future. 
But all of this is really only the beginning of what Russia and Putin want from Ukraine. The biggest thing they want of all is energy. While their overall economy is little larger than Spain's, Russia remains a global superpower through the lens of energy resources, and it's specifically oil and gas that is the most critical component to understand about Russia's worldwide ambitions. Across multiple vast oil fields, Russia is the world's second largest producer of oil ahead of even Saudi Arabia, while at the same time, Russia also possesses the world's largest proven reserves of natural gas, largely across Siberia, which has enabled Russia to become the world's leading exporter of natural gas. The revenues gained from the sale of all these oil and gas exports are the literal foundation for the modern Russian state and Russian power, because they provide as much as 50% of the entire Russian government's budget and represent about 30% of Russia's entire GDP. Russia has used the vast- I think it's- uh, no, it's- it's more than that. I'm pretty sure. I think it's... Or maybe he's just- is he talking about like all fossil fuels or is he just talking about natural gas? I, I missed it. For the modern Russian state and Russian power. Because they provide as much as 50% of the entire Russian government's budget. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He, okay, yes, it is true. This represent is true. About this is why I said uh, that energy, uh, like sanctions on energy would destroy the Russian economy. Like abso fucking lootly destroy the uh, Russian economy. However, it would also destroy Europe and, and many of the other, ironically, many of the other uh, even NATO, uh, uh, NATO member Baltic states. It would completely fucking cripple the, the entire globe, which is why it's a, like a double edge. It's a double edge sword. Destroy in uh, air quotes. Yes, motherfucker. What do you, how do you think societies run? right now like i mean we don't have full-blown renewable energy at all we don't have energy independence in the way that like uh, people uh like to think we do i mean i i, I know i'm now a ev evangelist myself okay considering that i have the take hussy but i still understand that the way to power that electric vehicle still relies heavily on at some point uh a, a type of fossil fuel you know it's just that's how fucking that's how powerful they are which European countries depend on Russian gas? North Macedonia, 100%. Finland, 94%. Bulgaria, 77%. Slovakia, 70%. Germany, 49%. Italy, 46%. Poland, 40%. France, 24%. Remember the French, uh, there were like the, the nuke boys in the chat when I brought up France and they were like, uh, that's not true. France has nuclear uh, reactors. Uh, they do not need the uh, Russian uh, gas. You are lying. Uh, but every fucking European country to some degree relies on it for stability. And relies on it for price stability, even if it's not for, uh, for uh, like a direct immediate need in the same way that like Germany needs it. They do not rely on it. They just use it because it's the most price efficient. I mean, well, again, it would, you still need to pay for the gas. And if the gas prices were unmanageable uh, and impossible to pay for, then you're still fucked. It's the same shit. Anyway. Especially at a time when, because of OPEC, you can't really, you know, you can't turn around and uh, go for anyone else. And another, another, other suppliers are sanctioned off from the rest of the global marketplace. Anyway, some of these countries also do not rely heavily on gas itself, but it's just another way for you to understand how much, uh, how, how much of a trade relationship Russia has, uh, how significant of a trade relationship Russia has with all these countries that are supposed to be adversaries. 30% of Russia's entire GDP. Russia has used the vast money earned from selling oil and gas abroad to fund their military, pay off debts, save cash, and finance its own restoration as a global great power. Russia is therefore effectively a petrostate just like Saudi Arabia or Iran, and is the only petrostate located in Europe, at least for now. For you see, despite these massive geological blessings, they also come with a number of geographical catches from Moscow's perspective. Most of their gas is sold off to the hungry customers in the European Union. So much so that 35% of the EU's entire gas supply comes from Russia alone. 
including Germany, the world's fourth largest economy who imports nearly half of their natural gas from Russia. This flow of gas towards Germany and Europe across this complex system of pipelines provides critical revenues for the Russian government to function and provides critical heat for European cities during the winter. And so both sides heavily rely upon the other here. Any disruption in this trade relationship would be disastrous from Moscow's perspective. And Ukraine is the most likely place for such a disruption to happen in the by the way, this is why while fighting in the middle of winter is a tactical disadvantage, normally fighting in the middle of winter is a tactical advantage for Russia because it's when you are most reliant on gas because uh, you need it for your energy, you need it for heating, uh, and you would get absolutely fucking cumstered. That's why I said it's a, it's a, a, a double-edged sword. Even though, if it was truly, like, if, if people wanted to put their money where their mouth is and genuinely wanted to uh, defend Ukraine and cripple the Russian economy in its entirety, then you would have to do something like this. And then the rest of the world would take a haircut or take a major L, which is also something that, you know, Europe is not willing to do or America is not willing to do either. In the future. Back during the Soviet times when Russia and Ukraine were both one country, pipelines were built across Ukraine almost like a bridge that transported gas directly from the Siberian sources to the customers in Europe. But then, all of a sudden, after the USSR's collapse, Ukraine was an independent country who was demanding tariffs to the tune of billions of dollars a year from Russia in order to continue using their country as a gas bridge to Europe. And Russia had no other choice but to agree, because the pipeline infrastructure anywhere else didn't yet exist. As late as 2005, 80% of Russia's gas exports heading to Europe were still flowing across pipelines through Ukraine. But in the decades since, Russia has sought to solve this over-reliance on Ukraine by building multiple new pipelines that avoid Ukraine entirely, like Yamal Europe across loyal Belarus, Nord Stream 1 and 2 beneath the Baltic that go directly from Russia to Germany, Moscow's largest single customer, along with South Stream, Blue Stream, and Turk Stream beneath the Black Sea. By 2024, Russia has uh. plans to completely cease all of their gas exports through Ukraine entirely, and the government will save billions of dollars in tariffs as a result. But that is hard. I don't know what that last one was. That's weird. Brought that up. That's a weird. What? Seems strange to me. What has been that. so threatening about Ukraine recently, significantly more menacing to the perspective of Moscow, was the discovery for the first time in early 2012 that Ukraine's exclusive economic zone within the Black Sea may contain more than two trillion cubic meters worth of natural gas, largely concentrated around the Crimean Peninsula. To make matters even more interesting, further technological advancements in the early 2010s that enabled the successful drilling of natural gas and oil from shale rock unlocked the potential shale gas hotspots for Ukraine around Donetsk and Kharkiv in the east and around the Carpathians in the west. Beginning in 2012, there was suddenly a very real possibility that almost out of nowhere, Ukraine had the world's 14th largest reserves of natural gas just behind Australia and Iraq. But as a relatively poor country, Ukraine lacked the finances, the technology, or the equipment to successfully harvest any of these resources in any large quantities. But that all changed when, shortly afterwards, the Ukrainian government began granting exploration and drilling rights to the likes of Shell and Exxon. It was suddenly possible that within a, a tale as old as time few years, these Western companies would enable Ukraine to transform into Europe's second petrostate, which would have not only been a direct and serious competitor to Russia's own gas supply to the European Union, and thus at the same time a major threat to the Russian government's budget and GDP, but would have also provided the easy path of eventual Ukrainian admission into the European Union and NATO as well. And this is what's- like The competition uh, uh, of Ukraine as a, as a a gas supplier is one thing and that's a threat that's an economic threat certainly because it it rips control away from uh russia it rips price controls away from russia except the main problem there is uh this part of the process really in my opinion what this whole situation is truly about
In 2012, at the time when these discoveries were initially made, the man in charge of Ukraine this was This is a Victor really Yon fucking good video, by the way. Like, really, really thorough and really, really good video so far. Nukovich, a pro-Russian politician who is keeping Ukraine more politically aligned with the interests of Moscow, so long as he was president. It's not just all about oil. No, it's not all about oil. It's about what, or it's not about fossil fuels. It's about... Fossil fuels creating opportunity for Western control over your country, which is where, I mean, which I'm sure he's not going to fucking mention, like the IMF comes in, uh, all of a sudden you start looking more EU and NATO eligible as a country. These are methods of control that the Western world uses regularly in an effort to take developing nations that are in a state of disarray and uh, uplift them. When in fact, it's not actual upliftment, it's just we're going to give you money. These are going to be conditional loans. With these conditional loans, we're going to turn around and uh, and and allow you to pay our companies like Shell, our companies in the uh, Western world to come in and take the fossil fuels uh, from the ground without letting you get a piece of that ever uh, for, you know, God knows however many fucking years because you personally do not have uh, the the uh, resources or the facilities to be able to do that. However, when it's Ukraine, they do have the facilities to be able to do that. They could technically go and do it with Russia, but then now you have a geopolitical conflict in your hands because that hurts. Uh, that is an opportunity that the Western world would not want to give up to uh, someone they consider to be a foreign adversary discoveries were not directly threatening to Russia, but when suddenly in February 2014, his government was toppled in a pro-EU and pro-Western revolution in Kiev, Moscow was very quick to take the opportunity to invade some of Ukraine, seize the Crimean Peninsula, and- Okay, these are the parts, so, okay, again, these are the parts of the conversation that uh, is not featuring everything, but up to this point, it was pretty good. Exit in the name of historical claims and protecting ethnic Russians. But but by seizing Crimea, the Russians also took direct control of two-thirds of Ukraine's coastline and, by extension, the vast majority of Ukraine's maritime exclusive economic zone. And most critically, an estimated 80% of Ukraine's potential offshore oil and gas reserves. In addition, billions of dollars worth of drilling equipment and other assets in the peninsula were seized by the Russians, all of which completely crippled the Ukrainian government's future potential to challenge Russia's gas supremacy in Europe. To make matters even worse from Ukraine's perspective, the areas of Ukraine that are the most rich in shale gas are located very near to the most major conflict zones encouraged and funded from Moscow, with the Donetsk and Luhansk rebellions here and the Transnistria breakaway republic in Moldova over here which, in my view, is not a coincidence. As a result, Shell and Exxon both backed out from all of their contracts with the Ukrainian government shortly afterwards, leaving Ukraine with no capability to extract the remaining resources themselves, and no capability to challenge Russia's occupation of Crimea. From the perspective of Putin and his regime, these were all mandatory actions to take in order to curb a Western-oriented Ukraine from ever selling major supplies of gas to Europe that would threaten his own regime's primary source of wealth and power. Ukraine had to be dismembered to protect himself and the other oligarchs who are in power. But there's more. Under Putin, Russia can't ever give Crimea back to Ukraine, because it would surrender the entire exclusive economic zone and all of the gas resources within it back, along with the strategic port city of Sevastopol, one of the very few year-round ice-free ports that the Russian Navy can use and- No, it's just more about NATO. No, it's not. No, it, it, it's, it's both. I mean, NATO and EU membership are, are things that you would never, things that the Western world wouldn't really uh, focus on or uh, bring up if it wasn't for the other. But it has been long known by American intelligence and American politicians in general that uh, Ukraine was always considered to be a red line alongside Georgia. This is why I bring up George W. Bush's... Uh, this is why I brought up George W. Bush's interest in bringing Georgia and Ukraine into NATO back in 2008 on his way out. That caused a lot of this conflict to begin. Georgia W. Bush. 
and needs to operate throughout the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. If Crimea was ever returned to Ukraine, and Ukraine joined NATO, they would regain their ability to threaten the Russian government's primary source of revenue, and the Russian Navy's most geostrategically valuable port would be lost forever. But Ukraine has some pressure that it can, and has, been applying itself. Naturally speaking, the geography of Crimea is that it's almost an island, only loosely connected to the rest of Europe and covered by dry and arid steppes and some salty marshes with very little fresh water for people or agriculture. Prior to the Russian invasion and annexation, the vast majority of Crimea's freshwater supply, was like 85% of it, came Ukrainian... down into the peninsula from a canal built during the Soviet era that diverted water from the Dnieper River. But after the Russians took it over in 2014, the Ukrainian government shut that off, and that's another reason for why uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, who, was, who was running out of freshwater reserves to uh, give to Crimea, wanted to open up the freshwater reserves once again through the North Crimea Canal into Crimea. 14, the Ukrainians weren't exactly in the mood to continue sending down the water, and they filled up the canal within their remaining borders to the north with cement and blocked the flow of all this water down into the now Russian-occupied Crimea. For the record, that is, again, a violation of human rights. Russia is completely inappropriate at fault for invading Ukraine, 1,000%. Uh, these are, these are, uh, you know, this is something that should be able to handle diplomatically, which is part of the reason why I get frustrated with, uh, the Western involvement in this circumstance, but one, no, it's not. You think shutting off fresh water supply to a group of individuals because, uh, they have been annexed and have been happy with, uh, their, their annexation and have voted time and time again or not voted, but polled time and time again, saying that they are happy to be a part of Russia, deserve, means that they deserve to get fucking uh, shut off from their water supply. Turkey shut off uh, Syria's water supply too. Is that okay? It's not natural water supply. It doesn't fucking matter. That's ridiculous. We've, we've covered the Crimean part of this conversation numerous times on this broadcast. I don't know if I actually have a YouTube video. I'm sure there's like one of the clip channels that have brought... Uh, I'm sure one of the clip channels have fucking put that out there. Uh, it, I'm not referencing the referendum. I'm talking about the numerous polls that have been conducted leading up to the referendum or the annexation and the numerous polls from Western pollsters that have been conducted time and time again in the aftermath of the, uh, uh, of the annexation that shows consistently that Crimeans... Uh, are one, majority Russian, and two, wanted to be a part of Russia, and are three, happy to be a part of Russia. And regardless, even if they weren't fucking happy, it still doesn't change the reality that cutting off their water supply is absolutely unacceptable. As a result, Crimea has ever since been essentially dying a death from a thousand cuts, as it steadily recedes back into the dry and arid steppe of history, while modern climate change is only making everything even worse. As 2020 was the driest year ever on record in Crimea since record keeping began 150 years ago. This is a as really, a really good video, for the record. Like, I mean, better than like 98% of uh, Western. 98% uh, of like Western coverage on this matter that I've seen. Well, thus the Russian far. government is struggling to maintain its hold. The capital city Simferopol's reservoir is today less than 7% full. Bro, it's not their water. It's explicitly being diverted from a Ukrainian river. Dude, what kind of fucking take is this? Who cares? The canal was built during USSR. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's something that the Crimeans rely on. That's an insane fucking take, dude. Oh, it's my water. Sorry. I, I'm not going to give it to you is a really, really fucking silly take that I don't understand how you can just say is appropriate. I thought you were supposed to be progressives. I thought you were supposed to literally say things along the lines of it, water is a fucking human right. There's a reason why in the state of California, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and other uh, local uh, municipal, uh, municipal uh, authorities are not able to cut off your access to water because even in the state of California, we recognize that water is a human right. That's a, is a really childish approach. Yeah. Motherfuckers acting like Nestle out here, dude was like, what do you mean? It's my water. It's my water. I drink your milkshake.
whole and the city has been what do you think happens when you cut off an entire region of its fucking water dude that's crazy having to ration water supplies even after the russians built a nearly four billion dollar bridge across the kerch strait here to connect the peninsula over to the russian mainland shipping in water is difficult and life for the more than two the source of the uh, the the napier river is in russia too and the russians aren't making a canal at the source billion people on the that peninsula would also is be, getting yes. harder after the annexation oh also they blew it up uh that dam so that dam is gone for the record so you know that did happen but again this did not need to happen and should not happen uh two countries that are uh up each other's assholes don't need to fucking do this to get to this level if turkey and syria can come to uh a a agreement to not redirect water or not shut off Syrian water like Turkey uh, used to do every now and then um, because, you know, the rivers go through Turkey that go into Syria that uh, give them water supply, then Ukraine and Russia should be able to do that as well. You know, unless there are uh, other interests at play. Other superpowers uh saying no this is something that you could absolutely do that um this you you could do that you should do that actually you should definitely keep doing that don't worry about it we got your back if there was someone else maybe saying that to this country that is much smaller uh than than russia uh, constantly goading them that could potentially be a, a reason for why they felt like they could do something like this. not better the Russian government is having to spend billions of dollars a year to financially prop up Crimea, and it's largely all because of this canal being shut down by the Ukrainians over on the other side. And Ukraine is obviously not in any kind of mood to open it back up again. As a result, the current crisis in Ukraine can also be seen through the lens of climate and water conflict. And it's- Yeah, thank God Russia is bombing Ukraine because they're running out of water bottles. I never said that. And I have, as a matter of fact, said the exact opposite time and time again, that it is completely unjustifiable, completely, completely unjustifiable to invade Ukraine, bomb Ukraine, do all of this over and over again. I repeat myself, but you do not want to hear that. You do not want to hear that because it makes you feel better uh, when you hear someone say something different than what you have been told otherwise. Uh, it, it makes you feel better when you can vilify me in your brain and think, oh, no, I'm totally justifying it. I'm totally justifying it. I'm totally justifying uh, uh, Putin's actions. You want to hear that regardless of what I keep saying over and over again. I cannot believe how many times I have to qualify this statement, and yet you still hear exactly what you want to hear because it's much easier for you to hear what you want to hear. It's one of the biggest reasons why Russia is doing what it's doing now. The current prime minister of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, has stated on multiple occasions that the primary goal going forward for the Ukrainian nation is the reclamation of the Crimean Peninsula from Russia. Currently, Ukraine has no realistic capability to challenge the overwhelmingly more powerful and capable Russian military. But in the future, were Ukraine to join NATO and a murky conflict breaks out between themselves and Russia over Crimea, or in the eastern rebel-occupied Donbass, where it may be unclear who started it, it's hypothetical that Ukraine could trigger Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which states that, quote, if a NATO ally is the victim of an armed attack, each and every other member of the alliance will consider this act of violence as an armed attack against all members and will take the actions it deems necessary to assist the ally attacked. Therefore, in the future, yep. the fear of those in power in the Kremlin is that Ukraine will bring in the rest of NATO to fight Russia in taking back Crimea. And that is a war that Moscow knows it will lose. Not only because of why NATO Russia is invading Ukraine by real life lore is the is the video, by the way, a very good video. Uh, mods have been spamming it periodically as well. much more advanced military capabilities, but because of Russia's own internal demographic problems. 
Ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia's deaths have exceeded her births, while the nation's fertility rate has been among the lowest in the world. And so the country's population has been shrinking almost continuously ever since. But since the COVID-19 pandemic began in 2020, this shrinking population problem has only gotten even worse. And Russia is currently undergoing its largest peacetime decline in people ever. In all of recorded history, even worse than during the 1990s right after the Soviet collapse. Right now, Russia has around 25 million men within the country who are of military service age. But the government knows that as time continues on, that potential pool of manpower is only going to get smaller and smaller. Therefore, it could be reasoned behind the inner walls of the Kremlin that the lean conflicts in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine, Russia has so far succeeded in keeping Ukraine out of NATO. And by building up troops along the border and hosting joint military exercises in Belarus, Moscow is further able to signal to Ukraine that they are in danger, which can panic investors in the Ukrainian government and damage the economy even further, and which forces Ukraine to spend even more money on their own military and defense, taking away vital cash that they could be using to further develop their own natural gas infrastructure. And of course, Russia has been fueling a war inside of Ukraine in the East now for years, ever since 2014, that has greatly depleted the Ukrainian government's time, manpower, and resources. After being taken over by pro-Russian separatists following Russia's invasion and annexation of Crimea, both Donetsk and Luhansk declared their independence from Ukraine eight years ago, and after being supported financially and militarily from Russia, have continuously been fighting a war against the Ukrainian government ever since that has already claimed the lives of more than 14,000 people. For years, True. most of the territory of each has been controlled by the Ukrainian. So here's the here's the part of this that for some weird reason does not get addressed. Uh, again, does not matter, does not justify Russia's actions here, does not justify Russia's actions uh, militarily in any capacity whatsoever. But as far as the DPR and LPR goes, okay, um, as far as all that goes, I want to I want to point to you guys a Associated Press article from January 21st, where uh, a Ukrainian general, I think it was like the Ukrainian defense minister or something, talked about the Minsk agreement. So the reason why I'm showcasing this is for you to understand how much the Western world had told Ukraine that they were able to, that they would have their back, that they were able to, they would defend themselves a, a, against Russia in a potential imminent invasion. Ukraine's security chief in January 31st, 2022 said, the Minsk peace deal may create chaos. Now, Ukraine's security chief warned West on Monday after forcing the country to fulfill a peace deal for Eastern Ukraine brokered by France and Germany, charging that an attempt to implement it could trigger internal unrest that would benefit Moscow. Oleksiy Danilov, the secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, told the Associated Press that Ukraine has the capability to call up to 2.5 million people if Russia invades. He said that about 120,000 Russian troops are concentrated near Ukraine and Moscow may stage provocations at any moment, but argued that launching a full-fledged invasion would require massive preparations that would be easily spotted. The, prep the preparatory period that will be noticed by the entire world could take from three to seven days, Danilov said. We aren't seeing it yet. We clearly understand what's going on, and we are calmly preparing for it. This was part of the reason why I also was confident in my analysis, and I got it wrong, and that's fine. Uh, just like the Ukrainian people got it wrong and, uh, and, and did not uh, agree with this. Uh, and that's why I always say like the people in Kiev did not Kiev did not think that it was going to occur. But the reason why I'm mentioning this is because while there were attempts at, uh, at a diplomatic solution or a, uh, a diplomatic uh, reinstatement of the Minsk agreements, which as uh, our friend here, real life lore it mentioned, both sides have violated who knows who started first. Because that is the agreement that would recognize at least the autonomy of LPR and DPR that is supposed to put an uh, end to the routine bombing campaigns that occurred in LPR and DPR for the past, uh, for the past eight years, which led to 13,000, 14,000 uh, civilians, 14,000 people dying in that region. 
there was definitely an attitude there, most likely backed by uh, Western, uh, Western sources telling him, like, no, you can fucking do this. Like, we got your back. We're going to keep giving you guns. We're going to keep uh, giving you money. And that there is no way to, uh, there's no way Russia will do anything that stopped either side from being able to get, uh, either side from coming to the table and putting any sort of uh, conclusive uh, ceasefire agreement forward. Literally spreading misinfo with that, with that bad contextualization, if you think so. <sighs> now, here's the, here's the other part of this. The main disagreement that a lot of people have with me and my analysis here is they say Russia wanted to, Russia wanted to, no matter what, actually take over the entirety of Ukraine. And I, a month ago, would have told you, absolutely not. I don't believe that at all. I do not believe that even remotely. Now I don't know. Now I, I don't know. I'm admitting that I don't know. Because of Russia's actions, because of Vladimir Putin's actions in the past week, I personally do not know if they legitimately wanted the entirety of Ukraine or control the entirety of Ukraine or not. Leading up to that moment, though, the military actions were routine. They were regular. It was commonplace, happened all the time. And that uh, they constantly gave weapons to LPR and DPR to fight back against the Ukrainian National Guard. Okay, not trying to be annoying, but is it fair that both sides in one country is a superpower with nukes? This has nothing to do with Ukraine. I'm not both sides in Ukraine. I'm saying that Ukrainian, the Ukrainian government would never take a stance like this if they weren't goaded uh, by, uh, by Western influence saying, like, we got your back, which then they fucking lied and did not have their back at all. That's the point that I'm trying to make. But ultimately, it doesn't even fucking, it doesn't even matter because Vladimir Putin completely fucked everything up, completely violated any sort of uh, potential uh, uh, diplomacy when he invaded uh, Ukraine and is currently bombing Kyiv. Billions in defense munitions and the West doesn't have your back, the fuck? Well, the West can't have Ukraine's back. Just like the West can't have Georgia's back, no matter what. I mean, they can do like joint NATO operations and maybe, you know, uh, Georgia can send troops into Iraq at the behest of uh, America or whatever as a show of good faith. But ultimately, they can't have their back. That's why Joseph Robinette Biden said time and time again, cut the malarkey, Jack. Americans get the fuck out of Ukraine. We're not going to go in and save you if Russia invades Ukraine. We have intelligence that Russia will invade Ukraine and you need to get the fuck out of Ukraine because we're not going to do shit. Reason why they said that was because a conflict between NATO, like an active conflict, hot war between NATO and uh, uh, Russia would mean nuclear winter. You made your point with less words. I, I don't like pointing this. It's like, I get it. It's a meme, but... It, but this this makes it seem like Russia was not doing anything in this situation. And they, they were. And they are. Part of the reason why there are active territorial disputes and part of the reason why they fucking kept uh, uh, beefing up LDR and I mean, LPR and DPR was specifically so that there was a territorial dispute uh, in uh, Ukrainian borders that made it impossible for them to join NATO. I know why you do it, but I hate how you have to explain this every stream. Yeah, I know. What is the reasoning of the West for not letting a peaceful discussion and agreement happen between Ukraine and Russia? Well, first of all, it's Putin's fault that the peaceful, uh, peaceful agreement can't happen now. It, uh, let's not fucking shift the blame back to fucking uh, the West in the situation when one superpower is literally fucking bombing the shit out of a smaller country in its borders. But before this happened, before this happened at all, the reason was so that one, your defense stocks go up. Uh, the military industrial complex keeps working. And two, um, a weak Ukraine benefits both Russia and also benefits the West. It doesn't matter how weak Ukraine is. Ukraine could literally turn into Afghanistan, and that would be a massive, massively beneficial move for the United States and Western powers that now all of a sudden have destroyed a foreign adversary. It was a gigantic... Uh, fossil fuel supplier to the rest of the fucking planet. You destroy them. 
Nord, like for example, Nord Stream 2, the pipeline that uh, he mentioned here as well, was going to give uh, Russia a profound amount of power and make its relationship even better with Germany. Germany would be uh, way more over reliant. Germany would rely even more on uh, uh, Russian gas, make it cheaper for them, right? And that's precisely why America, Donald Trump specifically, actually uh, would not allow that to continue or would not allow that to come to fruition. Very cringe to take the think that the West wants Ukraine to be weak. Dude, these are countries, man. They're not like, they don't have a morality. I don't know why you ever, why you would ever think of like morality in this equation. No one gives a fuck about the morality of a country being strong and powerful. Okay. That's not a real thing. It's a very liberal way of thinking. There's no morals here. They want fucking, they want a, a way to, to take natural resources and extract them from Ukraine. And the weaker Ukraine is, the more they can do that, the easier they can do that. I mean, entire revolutions have played out. And half the reason why uh, South American nations are the way they are, and half the reason why the Middle East is the way it is, is literally because of the, the exact same playbook here except in a lot of circumstances, there was no other counterbalancing superpower that could help those countries. Well, I guess the USSR back in the day in the Cold War, but that's it. Government. But just a few days ago, Russia, for the first time, officially recognized both as fully independent countries separate from Ukraine and deployed their troops into each. Right now, as I made this video, it's still unclear what exactly Putin is ultimately planning for Ukraine. He may only be plotting a limited strike into the country in order to permanently sever both Donetsk and Luhansk from the country, as he did with Crimea eight years previously, and effectively occupy each. He may also be plotting a further limited strike from Crimea in order to neutralize the block in the canal in order to free up Crimea's struggling water supply. He may be planning to go further, though, to ensure that this situation never happens again and push Russian territory all the way to at least some of the Dnieper River to simultaneously stabilize Crimea's geographic position by freeing up the water supply, deny even more of Ukraine's coastline and access to natural gas reserves, and yep. set up a stronger potential defensive line against any attack from the west along the Dnieper River's banks. Alternatively, he may also be planning a southern takeover of Ukraine, which would simultaneously bring Donetsk and Luhansk into Russia, link up Crimea with the Dnieper River and the canal, block off Ukraine from the rest of the Black Sea, and transform the country into a landlocked state, permanently removed from any remaining offshore gas deposits, and link up mainland Russian territory with both Crimea and loyal Transnistria in the west. Or he may really be planning an all-out assault to take over the Yeah, this is really good. This, I mean, this is actually really fucking good. ...entire country, so it's to guarantee that Russia and the CSTO's defensive lines against NATO are pushed further back towards the more narrow opening of the North European plain between the Carpathian Mountains and the Baltic Sea across the border of Poland. And in so doing, guaranteeing that Ukraine will never be used against them and that Belarus will never become an indefensible salient. From there, Russian provocations into Moldova are almost a certainty next. Another former Soviet state who isn't a member of NATO and conveniently already has a pro-Russian breakaway state that Russia will eventually get around to recognizing as well. Transnistria. It's all a part of Putin's repeatedly stated goal of bringing back the old Soviet and Russian empire for the 21st century. Now that Putin has chosen to invade, it's not entirely clear what's happening as the facts on the ground are rapidly developing. But what is clear are Putin's demands. He has demanded that the West agree to three main terms. One, that Ukraine never be allowed to join the NATO alliance. Two, that NATO and the United States withdraw all of their armed forces from Eastern Europe back to the pre-1997 boundaries of NATO. And that would never happen. That will never, ever in a million years happen, okay? It's an understandable concern for Russia before fucking invading Ukraine. It's never happening after uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Like, no fucking shot. It was already impossible. Anyway, let's continue. Ending in Germany, effectively abandoning. You said the same a week ago. What do you mean? 
Uh, everything that this video is describing, I've been talking about for a month leading up to this event. Poland, the Baltic States, and much of the rest of Eastern Europe. And that three, NATO and America agree to freeze the NATO alliance as is and rule out any future expansion of new members. And that the alliance will not hold any military drills in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, or in the Caucasus without prior Russian consent. The West and NATO, of course, will never accept any of these terms, and Putin must know this. But through the lenses of geographic security, the economic of oil and gas, the changing climate, the shortage of water in Crimea, and Russia's own sensitive internal demographic crisis, it's clear to see what Russia's primary concerns are with Ukraine, and only time will tell how Russia and Vladimir Putin act upon those concerns. But by analyzing how Putin has acted before during times of crisis, we can likely figure out how he'll act again in the future. The recognition of both Donetsk and Luhansk as independent countries and the deployment of Russian troops into both before launching the full-scale invasion across the entire country next mirrors a striking, uncanny resemblance to exactly what Putin and the Russian government did against Georgia 14 years previously back in 2008. Back then, the Russian army invaded the country of Georgia in what would ultimately become the first European war of the 21st century. Two pro-Russian breakaway provinces inside of Georgia, Abkhazia... But because it happened in 2008, nobody gave a shit because, again, it, it, it by the way, exactly the same uh, methods, but because it happened in 2008, no one gave a shit because, you know, we were dealing with our own economic crisis here and South Ossetia were each recognized by Russia as fully separate and independent countries and then, by using the pretext of Georgian occupation of both, Russia deployed troops into both and, from there, initiated a full-scale land, sea, and air invasion across the rest of Georgia. Across the 12 days of intense fighting that followed, the Russians occupied both Abkhazia and South Ossetia within Georgia, solidified their de facto independence, and effectively effectively dismembered the country, displacing nearly 200,000 people and causing Georgia to sever all diplomatic relations with Russia. However, it was, in the end, a decisive victory for Russia and for Vladimir Putin as it kept Georgia from joining NATO, and at a time when NATO and the West were more distracted by the quagmires of Iraq and Afghanistan, there was little international attention, let alone condemnation. It would only be less than six years later when Putin would deploy the exact same kinds of tactics that he used against Georgia, against Ukraine, in Crimea, and the Don. That people get mad at me for saying this, but that is definitely uh, good old wholesome fucking G Dub, uh, who has a road named after him in Georgia, um, saying we should include Georgia and Ukraine as a consideration into NATO. And then Russia was like, "Hold up, what, what do you mean?" Bass. And now in 2022, it once again appears that history is repeating itself in Donetsk, Luhansk, and Ukraine. Without a doubt, the Russian invasion- Because, sorry, uh, I gotta repeat this again, because when a country has active territorial conflicts with Russia, they cannot join NATO. For the very same reason that uh, countries want to join NATO, which is to be protected from uh, Russian- uh russia expanding uh, into their country that's the that's the back and forth in that situation but countries can't join nato if they already have an active territorial dispute that's precisely why european nations did not ever intend on ukraine joining nato and yet dangled it in front of their uh dangled it in front of ukraine numerous times made it seem like they would Asian of Georgia is absolutely <laughs> critical to understanding how Putin's modern military strategy of dismemberment works, and in understanding what he might ultimately plan to do with Ukraine. But, unfortunately, if I made a video about it on YouTube, it's a guarantee that it would get demonetized and age-restricted, and, as a result, there's simply no way that you would ever see it. 
So instead, I created yet another full-length companion video to this one in my ongoing Modern Conflict series that's about the exact same length as this video was, that covers the entire course of the Russian invasion of Georgia from beginning to end and uploaded it directly to Nebula, which, as you've probably heard by now, is home to tons of exclusive God damn, did, is he doing like a five-minute like ad? entire Modern Conflict series with ten other this additional- This does actually seem sick as fuck. I kind of want to watch this. Now, now that I've seen his, now that I've seen real life Lore's video uh, on on this situation, um, it's probably one of the best Western videos I have watched thus far that offers some, that offers like actual fucking uh, analysis rather than like, uh, it's because they're bad and have bad ideas, and this country is good and has good ideas. Like countries don't operate on on the basis of morality. I think most people fail to recognize that for some weird reason. I don't really blame you for failing to recognize that because obviously uh, you, you fail to recognize that because the media man doesn't tell you that. The media man tells you good and bad, evil and good, forces of good versus forces for, uh, for evil. Behind a paywall, I think we need to ask him first. Oh, wait, no, I'm not going to watch it on stream right now. I'm just saying I like uh, this but yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a fan. A full length episode Here, I'll with play more the rest than three of his video too. hours of additional content that you can go and watch right now, including this 26 minute long video that I made earlier about the entire history and course of the modern. Why is it broadly denied that Putin actually wanted to protect the people against Ukraine's aggression on LPR and DPR? Well, the invasion does not match the fucking uh, the 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 situation at hand. Like a full-blown invasion of Ukraine is not uh, justifiable uh, in an, in, if your interest is to protect the people of LPR and DPR, which have seen a fuckload of, of brutality for sure. Like the people that live there, I'm not even talking about like the leadership. I, I'm talking about like the actual human beings that live there have been suffering for eight years, uh, constantly getting shelled. Constantly getting fucking, constantly living under some of the worst conditions. Uh, totally, totally forgotten by the rest of the planet. But um, his recent actions are egregious and, and unjustifiable regardless. Do you think a main plan from them is to invade Turkey? What? No, dude. Turkey is a fucking NATO country. How, how is he going to invade Turkey, dude? He's going to put troops in fucking... What like he he would he would need to go uh, to our Armenia first like there's just no that's a ridiculous take man. <laughs> 